It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. In the earliest days of Christianity, followers of Jesus circulated inspirational stories of miracles and martyrs in order to bear witness to their faith. And in the face of terrible persecution, some Christians were tortured and killed in violent ways. They became inspirational exemplars to believers who followed after them. Of course, the phenomenon of martyrdom preceded Christianity in Jewish and Greek history, and and it's remained a staple of religious and political protest to the present time. Martyrdom's a complicated and contested status, though. It's come to be claimed by people who commit acts of violence against others, as opposed to simply accepting death themselves. Professor Jolyon Mitchell joins me in this episode to talk about martyrdom. He's the author of the Oxford University Press book called Martyrdom, A Very Short Introduction. Jolyon Mitchell is a professor of communications, arts, and religion at the University of Edinburgh. He's also worked as a producer and journalist for the BBC. We also spend a little bit of time talking about a recent book the Maxwell Institute published. It's a translation of an Armenian Christian text that features sometimes graphic accounts of early Christian martyrs. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. And if you enjoyed this very free podcast, there's something you can do to show your appreciation. Go to iTunes and rate and review it. I enjoy reading your feedback. It's martyrdom in this episode of the Maxwell Institute Podcast. Jolian Mitchell is Professor of Communications, Arts, and Religion at the University of Edinburgh. He's also Director of the Center for Theology and Public Issues there. He joins me today via Skype. And before becoming a professor, he also worked as a producer and journalist for the BBC. He specializes in religion, violence, and peacebuilding. And today we're speaking with him about his book from Oxford University Press. It's called Martyrdom, A Very Short Introduction. Thanks for joining me on the Maxwell Institute podcast today. A pleasure. It's great to be with you. So you wrote this book for Oxford University Press, and and the very short introduction series is really great. It's it's these a series of books on all sorts of different subjects, usually uh, under two hundred pages, very small books. And so you had to take the idea of martyrdom and distill it down into a small book. So how would you broadly define what martyrdom is? Talk a little bit about how that term is used presently and in in its different contexts, historical, political, religious, all the different settings that you might run into the term. Very good question. It is a it's a complicated and slippery term, but I began the book with a definition from the Oxford English Dictionary, which defines a martyr as a person who's killed because of their religious or other beliefs, and that martyrdom is the sufferings and death of a martyr. So in other words, it's something which now we understand as linked inextricably with dying for something you believe. That might be a faith, uh, a religious belief, or uh, even a political ideology. Now, the term has evolved and has changed, and that's something I look at in some detail. But as you say, it is difficult to actually take a, such a slippery term like this and compress it into what's a very short book. Do we know the etymology of the term martyr, um, where that comes from? Yes, it comes from the Greek martyrs, uh, which means witness. Uh, so it's it's somebody who bears witness to. And you can see that both in the Christian traditions uh, and also, it, interestingly, it's, it's there in Islam as well, this idea of bearing witness. And was it always connected with the idea of dying for that witness, or did that... No, no, it wasn't. It doesn't appear to be. In the New Testament, a number of New Testament scholars point out that actually there are elements where the word uh, bearing witness or martyr is used not necessarily as someone who tumbles into death, but maybe suffers for their bearing witness. So it's something which seems to have moved towards what some people describe as blood witness. In other words, that you're prepared to die for your faith, not just suffer for it. Hmm. So in this very short introduction, I, I really liked how you laid out kind of different scholarly approaches that different people could take to this question. It really helped me get my head around the idea. For example, one approach scholars might take is highlighting the creative role of individuals and communities who create a martyr after their death. Uh, w- what kind of things can come out of that kind of an approach? Well, I think it's it's interesting to watch how some and, and listen to how some traditions create martyrs after the person has died. Now, that can be across all sorts of different religions and also uh, in political contexts as well, that it might be, for example, a, a monarch, a king or a president who is 
assassinated or executed. And after their death, they can be turned into a martyr by the community that's left behind. And and the emphasis here, scholars emphasize here on the creative role of the community after the death of the individual. So it kind of looks at like why they would need this person to be a martyr, maybe what they did with that martyrdom, what kind of point they're drawing from it. Exactly. And you could think of how, for example, in the tradition uh, of the Latter-day Saints, you could see how Joseph Smith's death afterwards, how some people were perhaps creative with that story, that uh, belief of how how he died uh, and made use, use of that in creative ways and perhaps also in devotional ways. Definitely, especially early on, there, there were really interesting accounts that were very embellished that appeared shortly after Joseph Smith was killed. That Is that right? That's interesting. I didn't know that. So, because he was shot, wasn't he? I understand, at a, win- a window in Carthage Jail in 1844. Is that right? Yeah, that's where he was killed. Him and his brother were both shot there. And so that was Hiram, yeah. Hiram. So Joseph fell from the window after yeah. he was shot and, and landed near a well. And there, there were uh, accounts that were created shortly after that depicted things such as the mob coming up to him to strike him with a knife or something and, and a bolt of lightning uh, struck down and everyone was frightened and ran away and these types of things that that most other, you know, shortly after it was recognized that these were embellishments. Uh, there was also a folklore that grew up around the fate of the people who who killed Joseph Smith, they were they would be struck with some sort of diseases or, or that sort of thing. So uh, That's so interesting. It's a very interesting ha- – and you can see that process happening again and again in different traditions as well. And- yeah, it was cathartic, I think. So taking a creative approach, why were those stories created then? I think for Latter-day Saints, it would be very easy to say this was a catharsis. They felt justice hadn't been served and having these stories about um, justice being served through some sort of – uh, violent end for the perpetrators helped Latter-day Saints reckon with uh, probably their sense of powerlessness when when no one was actually brought to justice about it. That's interesting, isn't it? Because you could see that happening, for example, let's take another example, another really interesting example of creative embellishment around Thomas a. Beckett, mm-hmm. uh, who was, as you probably know, Archbishop of Canterbury, who on the 29th of December 1170, four knights murdered him in Canterbury Cathedral. Mm-hmm. And Within days or weeks, uh, his uh, parts of his body, bones, relics were being sent all over Europe. The director of the V&A Museum in London said there was Beckett mania going on uh, when he looks back at this event that happened uh, nearly 900 years ago or so. And it's extraordinary how that one death was embellished in terms of stories. People claim that uh, there were healings linked with his death. Other people point to the fact that actually Canterbury, which was quite a small town and relatively small cathedral, actually grew massively because it attracted hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of pilgrims because they wanted to go to the place where the martyr Beckett had been killed. And they went there and they would pay homage. They would want to touch his tomb. They'd want to buy uh, little uh, relics. Sorry, They would also get badges that you could wear as a pilgrim. And there was a whole industry that would go on for several hundred years until uh, Henry VIII finally closed down the tomb um, around Beckett and I think basically took all the gold and silver which people had left behind, all the pilgrims left behind and used it for his own purposes. Was there a sense there of, was there any reticence of maybe idol worship or ideas of like uh, how honoring a martyr can be connected to devotion to God? What kind of thoughts played out along those lines? Were there any concerns about theological issues with that type of thing? Or was it more like shut down because it had become inconvenient or... That's a very interesting question. And in a way, I think there are multiple factors of why it's closed down. I think it's probably also driven by a theological critique. Erasmus, uh, the famous humanist, Christian humanist, who visited Canterbury Cathedral before it was closed down, um, afterwards wrote this. It's actually a very funny sketch. It's a piece of comedy. It's a drama about these pilgrims going and being conned, uh, being tricked into giving uh, money away uh, because of, uh, of, of a, a false belief in what some people would say was a sort of idol worship almost. Hmm. So th- there's clearly a theological critique, but there's also a practical reason. As, as always, they're, they're, they're interconnected, really. Mm-hmm. But 
there was a lot of money there to be taken there there are some stories that there were sort of 20 wagons worth of gold and silver were taken from canterbury and given to henry the uh, whether that's true or not i don't know but uh, i wasn't there uh, but nevertheless it's it's quite interesting thinking about how the, the not just the the verbal embellishments went on but also you can see physical embellishments so mm. actually canterbury cathedral was extended so there was a bigger space mm. um, i mean i think it, it's also fascinating the desire of pilgrims to actually touch the martyr's body or touch the tomb of the martyr so so much so that they actually had to protect uh thomas beckett's body not just with a a um not just with a sort of a, a tomb and a casket but something above that as well but pilgrims would sometimes even try and get in between that just to get closer to the body so there's a a sense of of wanting to get close to the physical mm. uh presence or of course the absence as well of the martyr yeah there's something very heavy about the physical presence in the place and it, it's funny because sm on a smaller scale the same sort of thing happened with joseph smith and carthage i mean the, the lds church now owns carthage jail uh, you can tour carthage jail interesting yeah for a time, they actually still would claim to have had uh, a place on the floor upstairs where you could see blood, and um, I, that's been cleaned up now. And I and I don't know whether that was really the blood or not, but I know that they did have a place that was identified as the place where his blood was, and uh, now that's been restored over. And I, I think there were some anxieties about, um, you know, worrying about what that looked like, or, or you know, if, if Latter Day Saints somehow revered the blood of actual blood of Joseph Smith or something, which which I don't think was very common, but I. That may have played into it. There's also a relic uh, elements. Uh, they would cut pieces of his hair. And, and I know some people kept pieces of Joseph's hair. Uh, and, and some of those were incorporated into a, a cane, a walking stick or things like this. So so on a small scale, there was also and – and people still visit Carthage Shell today. So there's that pilgrimage element. Uh, there's that relic element that you see. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah. And, and I don't believe uh, many of those people had – a tremendous connection to martyr stories of the past. Um, you know, I haven't looked into that, so I'm not sure. But it, it almost seems like this sort of devotion uh, is is almost a natural thing that you could you could expect uh, a natural ex a natural expression of of grieving a, a, the loss of someone important to a religious tradition. Um, Did it extend to his family as well? Did it extend to Hiram and uh, perhaps some of Joseph's they're, they're both, close family? Yeah, they're both spoken of as martyrs. Um, Oh, the other thing was the burial as well. There were there they initially hid his body because they were afraid that mobs would uh, uh, come and dismember it or something. But um, it was later exhumed uh, in the early twentieth century. I, I think, gosh, I might have the dates wrong, but his body was exhumed, and they uh, and the, then they were reburied at a different location. And they have kind of a crypt over them now, where uh, where people do go and visit. So, um, as far as how martyrdom. Uh, with family members, I, you know, Hiram's thought of as a martyr as well, but um, there's never been any liturgy or any 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 other thing that's sort of grown out of the death of Joseph Smith. It's just thought that he sealed his testimony with his blood. This is an idea that Joseph, uh, it helps Latter-day Saints say Joseph was sincere. Uh, he wouldn't have put his life at risk in this way had he been conning people, I think is. Well, that's really interesting. It's fascinating. And it, it ties in, I think, with another category that I use in the book, a l closely linked with the creative interpretation of martyrdom or the creative processes surrounding martyrdom right. to, to what sometimes described as sort of evolutionary processes. Yes. Um, I, I'm t talking there about how it, it develops. Ideas about martyrdom do develop. There's historical evidence around that and, that, and that can change and transform with generations because the fact that you are describing it in the way that Joseph Smith's martyrdom, in the way that you are, suggests that you understand that development or, the, or that evolution. Yeah, to a small extent, right? And that was actually what I was going to ask you next was this evolutionary view. And, and, and one example here with Joseph Smith would be the idea that earlier stories – about the death had to do with comeuppance for the perpetrators and a, a heavy sense of injustice toward the federal government. And that element of things for Latter-day Saints has fallen away today. If you were to ask Mormons today what they think about Joseph Smith's martyrdom, they would refer exclusively to the religious elements, him sealing his testimony with his blood, whereas before it was also wrapped up in uh, this sense of injustice and, and, and the, the federal government's failure and, and that sort of thing. So what are some other examples of, of evolutionary changes in martyrdom that you can think of that are kind of similar or different uh, than that? Well, I think you can see it in the Jewish, Islamic and Christian traditions. You can see it actually with the term martyrdom, which clearly has evolved. The meaning of the term has evolved. 
and also the way in which stories are reiterated, repeated, translated, elaborated upon. Uh, another example, let's take an example from the Philippines, uh, where somebody called Jose Rizal, who back in 1890, in the 1890s, on I think it was on the 30th of December, again, was taken out and shot. Now, he was seen as the founding martyr, really, for modern-day Philippines. Mm. He's not well-known outside the Philippines, and yet, if you go there, everyone in the country will know about him. There's Rizal Park. His name is Rizal. So there's a park, there's houses, there's buildings called it. There's many films about him. And he really was whilst he was drawn towards Christianity, he was also highly critical of aspects of uh, colonial Christianity at that mm -hmm. time. And that's one of the reasons why he was actually probably executed. But he was a very much a non-violent martyr. But you can see how his story has evolved uh, so that it becomes something which is retold in lots of different ways, not just in films or television programs, but in novels and in uh, music videos um, and in poetry. There's a very famous photograph of him just about to be shot, which is widely circulated as the photo of him. You can see a whole firing squad as him about to be shot. But I think it's almost certain that it comes from a, a film that was made about 20 years after his death. But it, it, it's it's taken the historical meaning of his death is added upon layer upon layer. And it's interesting how I remember being in the Philippines and talking about this. And some people there were very keen that I got the precise story absolutely correct. And it mattered that I got it correct. But in fact, it had it clearly, as they admitted, actually, it had evolved as well, the story. Mm -hmm. So you might have first hand accounts or second hand accounts and then interpretations. And you, and you can see this again and again with different stories of martyrdom. Right. So these stories kind of evolve over time. Uh, there are different points of emphasis, different things that different communities emphasize that the next approach that you describe in this introduction, uh, you've, we've talked about the creative, uh, the creative analysis, the evolutionary analysis. There's an evaluative approach that you talk about where judgment calls are made. Well, exactly. And I think this is important. This is a place which I think does divide some scholars. Some scholars want to describe accurately. Uh, the technical term will be sort of phenomenologically, you know, what are the different phenomenons here? What's a historical account, a pro appropriate historical account of martyrdom? But other scholars want to say, actually, sometimes martyrdom can be dangerous. And they make a distinction between passive and active martyrdoms, or another way of thinking about it is uh, peaceful or predatory martyrdoms. And that's what I mean by evaluative. In other words, the martyr who is later described by a community as a martyr, but blows themselves up with the, the intended purpose, not just of killing themselves, of dying as a martyr, but actually of killing other people. Right. And so one for one group, that can be that's that's a martyrdom for another person. That's a suicide bomber. So that one person's terrorist is another person's martyr. And that's where a valuative process comes in. So and it's interesting, this phrase has stayed with me, actually, uh, around the idea of a predatory martyrdom. Mm. And that actually what's happening is people are using martyrdom as a way of asserting their belief system onto other people in violent, aggressive ways. And and unfortunately, we can see that happening across different parts of the world uh, today, this week, this month. That's where it gets really difficult, too, because you could say um, these types of violent responses are, in fact, responses, right? Uh, these types of people who might go and commit a suicide bombing would say, well, uh, I'm doing this because my the people that I'm representing are being persecuted or sometimes even killed. And so this is a way for me to uh, fight back against that. And so that's, I think, you know, people could say, well, that does count as a martyrdom. But it seems like there's a, the evaluative approach seems to be questioning the ethics of the act or the ethics of of how the exactly. martyrdom is playing out. Exactly. You could, for example, I think the current Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, in the a recent address at Canterbury Cathedral, at the place where Thomas a Becket was killed, uh, developed that exactly that kind of evaluation and said that actually that it's all if I remember rightly that it's been captured the term um, and other people I, I don't think Justin Welby did but other 
scholars have talked about almost the term has become poisoned by this action. So these are very highly critical evaluations. And I mean, I, I think it's there in the book, but I don't I don't move down a evaluative path, but I make it clear that it's possible to go that way. And I mean, personally, I think if somebody uh, uses martyrdom to kill other people, it's clearly something which is um, deeply, deeply problematic and should be critiqued. And that would be that evaluative approach. Uh, exactly. would be doing that. So the fourth way uh, is the inclusive approach. And what's that? The- Inclusive is to try and be, and this is the, another approach which is used, is to be tr- truthful to the fact that if people describe this as a martyrdom or a martyr, then we need to value their description. We may not agree with their description. We may not agree that somebody blowing themselves up on a bus to kill other people or uh, in the underground or taking an aeroplane right. into, uh, into a, a skyscraper. Th- th- these are these acts, these are, of course, acts open to serious critique and, and judgment. But nevertheless, there are some communities who would describe uh, those actors, those agents, those individuals as martyrs or these as martyrdom operations. We may not agree with that. We may not do that term, but we at least need to recognize that some people would describe them in these terms. And that's what I mean by an inclusive approach. It's, it's just being truthful to how people are speaking. It almost It's an approach that resists a moral or ethical evaluation, or I should say that resists imposing a particular moral or ethical lens, right? Because it, it would include talking about the morals and ethics of the that would, be, that would be fair, though it's interesting that sometimes it's possible to move from an inclusive approach to an evaluative approach. Yeah, In it would be words, setting it up. Exactly. You could say, well, there's this whole range of different kinds of acts that are linked with martyrdom, some of which you can see and celebrate and some of which you can see and critique. So which of these approaches or or, or how many of them did you uh, employ in your very short introduction? I suppose I was drawn partly to a historical approach, which was drawing on each of those four, but allowing the reader to make the evaluation en route as well. Mm. So it, part of it is an encouragement to readers uh, to think critically about this process and practice, which has got a long history, which will take us right back towards the Greeks, for example, their discussion of the noble death. That's Jolian Mitchell. He's professor of communications, arts, and religion at the University of Edinburgh. And he's the author of Martyrdom, a very short introduction. We're speaking with him today on martyrdom. Um, there's a really pro- provocative statement in, in your introduction where you say, uh, a martyr's death acts as a question mark. In what sense did you mean? A question mark over many different people's understanding of martyrdom. A question mark also after over those who killed a person. In other words, supposing, let's take, uh, for example, the judges of Socrates who insisted that he would kill himself because he was supposedly perverting the youth of the day uh, in Athens. You could say that his death actually puts a question mark over the judges Mm -hmm. in the same way that you could say that Joseph Smith's death in Carthage in 1844 puts a question mark over those who shot him. In the same way, you could say that Stephen's stoning puts a question mark over those who kill him. Mm -hmm. So you can see that practice, uh, the, the, the way in which someone's death raises a question mark over the killers, a question mark over the interpreters, but then also the question mark over the communities that are left behind. Because there's also a sense in which, what does it mean for us, someone dying uh, for their belief? I think it was Oscar Wilde, uh, the Victorian playwright and writer, who said that because a person dies for their belief, it doesn't make their belief truthful and that's a paraphrase but that's roughly what he's saying so of course there's a sense in which we need to critique because somebody kills himself you know blows up uh them and many other people doesn't mean to say their belief is right yeah he says uh i think the quote is a thing is not necessarily true because a man dies for it thank you yeah yeah 
Well, thank you. It's right there on <laughs> page five of Martyrdom, a very short introduction. Uh, so let's talk about portraying martyrdom. Uh, this is, you know, when this is a way for communities after the death of a martyr to keep that martyr in memory or to make arguments or inspire devotion or there are many different reasons why martyrdom is portrayed. Let's talk about a couple examples of portrayals of martyrdom. Uh, your chapter focuses on paintings and representations of, of two different types in particular. And you mentioned Socrates. Let's start with him. What about portrayals of Socrates? Some people would say that Socrates wasn't a martyr, but other people would say that he is actually the founding martyr in the Western tradition. But the picture that I particularly focused on, and I was really pleased that we were able to get it from uh, the New York's Metropolitan uh, Museum of Art, is Jacques Louis David's Death of Socrates, because your eye is drawn inexorably towards this figure. He dominates the picture. He's point, his finger is pointing to heaven. And all around him, people are in grief. But there's one figure who is holding your attention and he's poised. And it, it's an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary representation of almost like a revolutionary death. Because, of course, this picture wasn't painted at the time by any means. It actually came out just before the French Revolution by one of the great uh, revolutionary artists, David. Um, and it's saying something not just about the noble death of Socrates, but also about uh, the French uh, situation, the, the, the French nation in the 1780s as well. So it's, a, it's worth seeing. It's a fascinating, if you're in New York, I, I recommend popping in and having a look because it's not a very big picture, but it's a picture that's very much stayed with me. Because again, for me, it raises questions about what is a martyrdom. Uh, and it also raises questions about uh, you know, how do you stand up for your beliefs and what beliefs are worth dying for? So, I mean, briefly, Socrates, basically, uh, he was convicted of uh, leading the youth of, uh, of Athens astray, right? And he was convicted of that. And so he had to drink hemlock, right? Is that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. the basic story. Yeah. So the French revolutionaries would look at that story and kind of apply it to themselves, right? Yes, it was really an account of inspiration. You know, we're prepared to die to change the political situation. So there's a sense in which that this is a revolutionary picture for a revolutionary age. And you talk about the idea of a noble death. You, In, in this painting that you're talking about, you've got Socrates, he's the commanding figure there. His, 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 his chest is exposed. He's probably the most well-lit person. His face is very calm. When in, in the face of death. So what is this idea of a noble death? And well, it was a common phrase, uh, not just relating to Socrates, but to other figures in the ancient world. And you can see it, I think, if I remember rightly, with people like Hannibal or even Lucretia as well, and even Antony and Cleopatra, when they were defeated, they would fall on their swords. So there's was a, a sense in which you wouldn't face execution, but you would die a noble death. And that this idea of the noble death was drawn upon, particularly by early Christian writers, for describing the deaths of early Christians as well. Uh, and you can see this happening into the Middle Ages as well. The other um, big example that you talk about in this chapter uh, about portrayals is portrayals in texts is the Maccabean martyrs. Uh, what's what's the story with the Maccabean martyrs and, and their portrayal? The Maccabean martyrs were resisting another imperial power and they were not prepared to compromise. They weren't prepared to compromise about dietary habits, for example, about eating pork uh, or uh, worshipping or um, to, um, acquiescing uh, to the the, the invading powers. And the picture, again, I used a 19th century picture, but it's actually taking us right back, uh, right back to the sort of Maccabean time, which is around sort of 1, 125. Um, and it's, it's very much a story. I mean, they, these are very graphic and, and actually quite a gory stories, really, of a mother, for example, who uh, watches her sons uh, being killed one by one, uh, five, six, seven sons, if I remember correctly, uh, being killed because they wouldn't compromise on their belief. And it's these stories, these Maccabean martyrs were again picked up by early Christians and they were seen as sort of proto-martyrs. For these, these were another account, not so much noble deaths, but these were more like voluntary violent deaths. But again, the emphasis here is on 
there's a, a voluntary way in which people face their death because they were saying, I will not compromise here. Um, in fact, I think in, in martyrdom and Judaism is that the phrase comes in much, much later that the phrase is usually used is Kedush Hashem, which means the sanctification of God's name, mm. uh, which was linked to sort of a public dedication uh, to God. And you can see this as a resistance against Hellenism in particular. And it would be relating to observing the Sabbath, um, refusing to eat pork or, or meat sacrifice to the sort of foreign foreign gods. So martyrdom in these particular instances was used to talk about the noble death, Socrates calmly accepting his fate. Um, that would sort of set up later martyrs to want to do the same. Uh, also, same with voluntary violent death. Uh, the Maccabee stories uh, and Socrates both kind of served as prototypes or exemplaries for later Christian uh, martyrs as well, right? Like exactly. These. There are some scholars who point to these traditions as informing and shaping early Christian understandings of martyrdom. And there's clearly evidence of that uh, where you actually see where there's, there's quoting, uh, there's even churches, uh, if I remember rightly, uh, that are named after the Maccabean martyrs. Christian churches. Wow. That's really interesting. Uh, let, let's talk more about the Christian context a little bit as we uh, talk about martyrdom as remembrance. Another chapter in your book focuses on the idea of remembrance. And as we mentioned earlier, the word martyr itself wasn't originally associated with death. It was associated with witnessing. And so public witnessing over time is a way of carrying the memory of a group. And uh, Jesus, obviously, within Christianity became the prototypical martyr. Uh, the one and that's that, that in itself is very interesting, isn't it? Because some people say he is the first martyr and other people say he's the the prototype of martyrs so yeah, the, the first difference? martyr in christian well exactly and i think it's almost a semantic argument yeah. that i wouldn't lose a huge amount of sleep about <laughs> <laughs> except, but it matters except, to some people so why though yeah no no no, no, no. and I, I think that's interesting and clearly you can't get away from the fact that, that the heart of christianity is the passion story the death of jesus he is not a predatory martyr he doesn't pick up a sword there he faces his death uh, calmly and faces it boldly courageously and this is clearly an inspiration to thousands of other martyrs later and if other people would say the first christian martyr would be seen as stephen right in, um, in the book of acts in the book of acts and there you see stephen of course being uh, martyred by by stones uh, Again, we were delighted to be able to use a, uh, a, a interesting medieval picture by Dadi there of him being stones. It almost looks like there are stones like potatoes coming around his heads, really. Uh, but I, I, I'm not I'm not using that to demean what went on there. It's just interesting how how difficult it is to capture the moment of martyrdom visually. But again, the Stephen story takes us on towards other early martyrdoms. And again, I think it's good to be critical about the whole history of martyrdom in the early church because they, I think there is some overclaiming of you know, millions of martyrs in the early church, which is clearly not historically defensible. But there were a number of individuals who did face death because of their belief uh, in Jesus. And you can see that perhaps in early accounts. For example, one of the most famous is on Perpetua, a young woman who still was nursing her baby, probably only in her early 20s. The baby was perhaps under one. And she resisted her father and would not worship to the Roman emperor. Mm. And she has this extraordinary vivid dream the night before her martyrdom in the arena of being met by Jesus and being in a fight with a, a gladiator. And it's almost certain, I mean, almost all scholars that I encountered see that embedded in the early accounts, we actually have her voice there. So we're actually hearing this young woman uh, the night before her death. Um, and it's extraordinary, extraordinary piece of writing. It's very moving, actually, listening, listening to her and thinking of what what she would not budge on, uh, which was a sort of passionate belief uh, in in following Christ. So we have these really uh, impressive accounts of people that, that can embolden later believers to have faith in the face of persecution. And you also mentioned that martyrdom became something that was exaggerated over time, that the numbers of martyrs uh, was exaggerated, and there were probably embellishments in the stories of, of how some people were killed. Uh, some accounts are particularly um, 
grisly and vivid. And that's not to say that grisly, vivid things didn't happen, but um, you know, these these types of accounts uh, they did, and they 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 clearly became dramatized. I mean, some people would say they became almost like Hollywood movies in that they were trying to grab people's attention with these graphic red martyrdoms as they're sometimes described but you can see this move from red martyrdom towards white martyrdom and the idea there is more of dying to oneself every day not of giving up your life and part of that was of course because christianity was adopted as the imperial religion yeah and so you you didn't need to stand up the empire you actually needed to do some other kind of martyrdom and this led towards what some of us described as sort of der- desert spirituality where wh- where people would leave the city and go and sit on the top of a pole or a, a pillar for 20 30 years or live on their own in a cave in the in the desert and this was a form of martyrdom but sometimes known or later known as white martyrdom like you were dying to active life and participation kind of a thing Exactly, exactly. But also to the idea of, I suppose, almost sort of self-mortification mm-hmm. of actually that you're picking up your cross daily. If you can't give up your life, then at least you can give up your comforts of your life. What about these um, rumors that there were there were Christians who actively sought or like really tried to get martyred? Like uh, I, th- I think it's in Confessions, I think, where he talks about uh, Christians running into classrooms or something and making a big fuss and trying to get – uh, trying to get beat or trying to get uh, perhaps even killed for the cause of Christ. Like, there, w- were those types of things really going on before Christianity became the religion of the empire? Yes, I think there is evidence that suggests that that actually individuals wanted to be martyred. This was seen as the top way of serving Christ, and so that some individuals wanted to seek martyrdom they actually almost desired it and then there was clearly internal critique of saying well you know you used augustine but there's a number of church fathers who say that is not the way to serve christ we shouldn't go actively seeking for martyrdom Hmm. uh, because this is actually not this is is not the way to serve christ but other point out that actually the blood of the martyrs were some of the foundations of the of the church And so you can have some people saying, someone like Justin Martyr, for example, saying, I watched them stand fearless in the face of death and of every other thing that was considered dreadful. I mean, this is a, we don't know exactly that, but in other words, what he saw changed how he thought about Christianity um, and that other people pointed to the fact that this extraordinary boldness of early Christians in the arena, in other contexts, actually was a media asset, as one scholar described it. Yeah, I was going to ask you about Justin Martyr. Just his name was was that just a uh, was that connected to actual martyrdom, or where did that come from? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I think what's clear is he was drawn um, to. Oh martyrdom yeah, he was drawn in because of martyrdom. And I think, okay. if I remember, he's often described as the first Christian philosopher, and he himself was beheaded around. 165 okay. during the reign of Aurelius. So it's probably could could be related to things before and after uh, his death. Uh, yeah, but I, no, I think it's because he died because he died for his beliefs and for refusing to sacrifice to the gods. Hmm. So you talked about how state persecution lessened as the church grew in power, killing sort of died off, and new forms of martyrdom emerged, and 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 white martyrdom was an example of that. But at the same time, there was a growing cult of the saints. Uh, that emerged. These are stories of stories of martyrs became part of the liturgical calendar. And talk a little bit about how martyrdom became such an important point of focus in the worship of Christians, even after official persecution lessened. I think that's interesting that you can have saints days, you have martyrdom days where specific individuals were remembered. In other words, it became integrated into the liturgies of the church. Uh, for example, there's a very interesting new book out recently called The Armenian Church Synaraxian, uh, which I think is going to cover all the months of the year. But it's a very interesting translation by a guy called Edward Matthews that that draws, if I understand it correctly, on original Armenian texts. And then on the other side, you have it Armenian, and on the other side, you have descriptions of saints, some saints, but also of graphic martyrdom stories. Yeah, the Cynic Sarion um, is published by the Maxwell Institute here, uh, and like you said, January was the first one, 
And as I'm reading through this, when, when it very first came out, I'm, <laughs> I'm struck by some of the graphic details that would be included in a work of liturgy. And by liturgy, we mean a, a text that's going to be used in church worship. So this is a text that they'll perhaps read during church services or, or to organize the, the church calendar, right? And so you have this, you're including quite violent graphic things in, in the act of worship. No, that's books. That, that's right. It's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, and I was, I, I mean, I was very interested to read some of the accounts. There, it's vividly translated. It's dramatic, and it doesn't leave much the imagination. And yet, there's clearly evidence of elaboration here, of of mm -hmm. stories being developed, of being added to, of being made more graphic, um, and to being borrowed show, too from different, <laughs> from different, different areas that's of the church. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. Uh, but I, I think this is one scholar describes that what, what we have with martyrdom is it's it's an example of a usable past. It's part of a usable past, a part of a living tradition uh, so that it's it's going on. You know, these stories are alive today. They may have happened hundreds of years ago, but they still have meaning today as well. Right. Um, the rise of publishing books and images, the printing press. You write that this impacted martyrdom and how it was talked about and how it was understood. Let's talk about Fox's Book of the Martyrs. This happens to be a book that Joseph Smith is is reported to have been reading in, in the days leading up to his own death. So what was Fox's Book of the Martyrs? Fox's Book of Martyrs is an extraordinary compendium of martyrdom stories. It's also a huge book. <laughs> what I find absolutely fascinating about this book is that in in England, and I, I do meet in England, then it, alongside the Bible, it was placed in church after church after church. It was a very, very popular book, partly because it was deeply anti-Catholic, partly because it had extraordinarily vivid pictures in. I, I found it interesting looking at one of these old copies in Cambridge University Library, and you open it up, I mean, it's extraordinarily touching a book of sort of 400, 500 years old or so. But you can see there are pictures there of the martyrdom of early Christians, of some of the Reformation leaders as well. But where you have these graphic pictures, you can see that people have looked at them while eating or drinking. So there's even sort of like beer stains on the or coffee stains on the pages. Uh, and you can see there's, I mean, I think there's evidence of sort of food because they weren't just in churches. They were also in taverns, in inns, in places where people could relax and look at these pictures so that the most worn pages in Fox's Book of Martyrs were actually the picture pages. Mm. But it went through four different editions. There it was a publishing hit in the 16th century, four different editions. That is during Fox's life. Uh, because he was very much a, a, a Protestant, uh, almost like a Protestant advocating journalist for promoting one particular view of, of Christianity. And he uses martyrdom to do that. What was it? What was that view? How would martyrdom promote it? Well, I think it was that the true faith was being followed by figures such as Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. These were bishops who were who were burned in Oxford. You can go to Oxford now and you can see in the centre of Oxford uh, at St Giles, you see a, a 19th century monument to this act that took place in the 16th century. And in fact, in the in the very short introduction, uh, I was delighted that we could get a picture from Fox's Book of Martyrs where you can actually see, it's almost like looking into the top of a volcano. I don't know if you can see it there, that you can see there the two figures are not actually being burnt, but they're about to be burned. And then there's a Catholic preacher preaching against them. And then at the top of the tower, there's Thomas Cranmer. And Thomas Cranmer was the Archbishop of Canterbury who they thought, the, the religious leaders at the time thought he had denied his Protestant faith. But then very dramatically in Oxford, he would stand up and say he'd made a mistake and he ran to his own martyrdom and the thing that he put in first into the fire to be burnt was his hand which had signed the recantation so it's a very dramatic story these are dramatic powerful stories that are saying that here are the true inheritors of or the true followers of the early church of, of christ it's so in, in other words in their martyrdom there is a question mark a critique going on of 
the 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 papacy at that time so you can see that's a critique going on which of course later there were counterpoints there were counter stories put a, put about uh, about the the um, fox's book of martyrs so it's by no means an uncritical un, uh, uncriticized account it's really an, a striking image and this woodcut so they would take basically a piece of wood they would carve this image into it and then they would coat it with ink and then press it kind of like a, a stamp almost i suppose uh, yes that's a really good way of describing it that's exactly it's almost as if that it's it's in it's in Bossed onto the paper, yeah, uh, and it's extraordinary seeing it and touching it because it still holds its power when you look at it today. And and th- so there are a lot of illustrations, and you said th- those were the most popular ones. That's really interesting because they're graphic uh, depictions, and it's a little bit different from what we see today. For example, um, ISIS is releasing videos, uh, the the terrorist group um, releasing videos of them killing people, and there's debate about whether. Uh, media should show those things, and and oftentimes media will show an image of the person being killed, and then they'll they'll cut away. They, we, we don't show the actual thing. Would, how about a back then was a drawing like this that provocative? Were they, or or did they also see it as a step removed because it was just a representation instead of now we have photograph. Well, you've got, and and I was going to say, you also have an image in here of people holding a photograph, a protester holding a a photograph of, uh, of an, uh, I believe, an Iranian woman who was murdered, and and you see her face, bloodied face, and uh, you know, comparing that to the image from Fox's book, it's, you know, I see a difference, but you know, like like I say, we have photographs now; they didn't then. So, uh, talk about that. They. You're, you're right. Uh, and I think that you've raised a number of very important points. Uh, let's stay for a moment with the, you, the the Iranian picture, because, I mean, actually, this picture, I need to let you into a bit of a secret here. In the, th- th- There's actually a mistake here, and it's agonizing as an author, mm. if you see there's a mistake when the copy is there. And it's a mistake that was actually repeated around the mediascape, around the, the world, because the picture shows a bloodied face and a uh, a face that looks like the same woman before she was killed. In fact, they're not the same person. Mm. Uh, and we found this out after it was too late to change it for this edition of the book. It's now been changed. Uh, but it, in a way, that was a mistake that came out of Facebook. So that wasn't a publishing mistake or an editorial mistake. It was straight after her death, people wanted to say she was a martyr in protesting against the Iranian government at that time because she was a a young teacher and a 27 year old she was stuck in a traffic jam in Tehran she was very hot in the car she stepped out of the car and unfortunately she was shot and as she lay dying she her death was filmed uh, on mobile phones and it was put onto YouTube and some people say this is she's the first YouTube martyr and is the death of the first person who's been seen by millions of people the death and, and yet her story was used again and again partly as a protest against uh, the then Iranian government and particularly the le- leader so people were wearing badges or holding posters saying I am Nada that was her name yeah so she is a very different kind of martyr almost a passive martyr because she didn't mean to be a martyr to some of the yeah. other figures we've been discussing and indeed another martyr that I, I look at in some detail in the book uh, is a a young 15 year old who or probably actually may have been younger a young child child soldier from iran who put around his waist a number of grenades put himself in front of a tank and blew himself up and stopped a whole row of tanks in the iran iraq war and his story was used as a celebration of a military martyrdom and it's interesting to contrast th- those two different stories one if you like of a passive martyr and who didn't intend to be a martyr and the other of an active martyr who actually is using their death towards a particular end. So what was the mistake? Is the image not really her or? No, the mistake is that the image of the bloodied face is her, but the mistake is that the face, which is without blood next to her. Yeah. Superimposed there. Superimposed is whilst it was initially claimed to be her, was not her, okay. was another person um, who had the same sort of name, but her life was almost ruined by this mistake. Mm. Um, 
and it's it's very interesting that I mean actually it but for me that illustrates the what we talked about earlier the creative force of going on after someone's death right do, do you do you see what i'm saying i know it's hard without seeing the picture and no, i'm looking at it look at the book yes but i'm I, thinking I can, about our listeners as well right right i mean i'd put a picture up on the blog but i don't know if i want to <laughs> perpetuate no, i the... think i think i think it's i think I'm, I'm very aware that we need to tread carefully around people's deaths that i mean that, that and in a way, when I'm talking about Martin, I'm very aware that these we're not just talking about movies here. This is actually the, the end of people's lives. And often it's deep tragedy. It's very sad. This is heartbreaking. If this was my sister or my mother or, or wife, I would be heartbroken by this picture. And yeah. and that's why I think there's a. I think there's an appropriate dignity, which I, I thought very carefully about which pictures we used and. Um, how we use them and so on. Right. Getting back to comparing this photograph with the woodcut in the Book of Martyrs is back then you didn't have uh, phot photography. And so um, was there any consternation back then about whether or not to show such depictions? In the media today, people ask questions like you did. Is this appropriate to show this? Um, what about What about that? A very interesting question, isn't it, to think through how people respond to the pictures. Uh, it, it's difficult, isn't it, to step 500 years back in time into someone else's imagination. But the reality was that many people in what sometimes describe as early modern Europe would have seen, experienced or heard eyewitness accounts of executions in the public square. I know some countries still have executions, but they're normally done behind closed doors, behind in secrecy. I mean, I know right. that's not entirely the case in some countries in, in the Middle East and so on. But but nevertheless, the, the majority of those executions take place in secret or with just a few witnesses. But hundreds of people could have, could have watched these executions. I mean, you only need to go, for example, to the execution of charles the first of england um and there were hundreds of people watching in the same way at louis um in the french revolution uh perhaps thousands of people watching there they, they watched they observed they noted some people even drew so this was arguably a more common experience however now we are being offered different kinds of martyrdom we're being offered martyrdom uh up close, up personal. And this, some people could say that ISIS, if you take ISIS for an example, are using martyrdom um, or, or executions as a way of trying uh, to communicate spectacular death as a way of trying to provoke fear, anxiety, anger, and so on. Mm. That's Julian Mitchell. He's a specialist in religious violence and peace building. And he's a professor at the University of Edinburgh. And he's uh, joining us today uh, from there. We'll take a brief break and be right back with the conclusion of this episode. Now that you've already read all of the scripture commentaries that promise to make your scripture study easier, it's time to dig a little bit deeper. Latter-day Saint philosopher James E. Faulkner has written the Made Harder Scripture Study series on the premise that our scripture study is only as good as the questions we bring to the table. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University has already published The Book of Mormon Made Harder, The Doctrine and Covenants Made Harder, and The Old Testament Made Harder, and now The New Testament Made Harder is finally available. Each book is filled with challenging questions with occasional commentary to make reading harder, or rather, more fresh and surprising and demanding. These Made Harder books are an excellent tool to improve your personal or family scripture study, sacrament meeting talks, or Sunday school lessons. The New Testament Made Harder by James E. Faulkner is now available at Amazon in digital and print formats. So much of modern life is geared to finding faster and easier ways to do the same old things. The Made Harder series is proof that making things easier does not always make them better. Uh, we're back with Jolly and Mitchell. He's a professor of communications, arts, and religion at the University of Edinburgh, and he's the author of Martyrdom, a Very Short Introduction from Oxford University Press. <clears throat> so 
You mentioned uh, the first YouTube martyr. You mentioned that that, that was a, a topic of discussion. And in our information age, it seems like martyrdom is ubiquitous because we can have access to so many more martyr accounts, not only historically, but also all the stories that we might hear in the news, um, especially involving groups like ISIS and other things like this. How has martyrdom and its representation shifted as a result of those more recent iterations of martyrdom? Um, martyrdom kind of has a black eye, so to speak, right? Because now it's really associated with uh, with violence against others. So has that impacted the way that religious people think about martyrdom uh, that aren't involved in those types of violent acts? I think martyrdom is a hot topic now in all senses. So there is a contest around who is a martyr, what is a martyrdom? And you can see this in execution videos, in stories about uh, martyrdom operations. But you can also see that on, for example, the West Wing, the West Face of Westminster Abbey in London, where you have a number of different martyrs represented, modern martyrs. They, these were not predatory martyrs, but they were, some people would say, people who died for their faith, uh, for Christianity. And you can see, for example, people like Martin Luther King or Oscar Romero or, or Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And these are being celebrated and commemorated uh, around th these individuals and particularly their deaths are being celebrated uh, and commemorated around the world in ways that are perhaps different from some of the martyrs who give up their lives to kill other people but there's you you raise a very important question about how modern media now draws us close to deaths um in a way that was simply not possible in a pre-digital pre uh community uh, telecommunicative age but it's not and it's also kind of it's 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 also more complex just because in addition to having access through media to accounts of martyrdom and and you could even go online and see videos of of actual uh martyrdoms and some some people do that but we also have violent media in general so there's a sense of the boundary between actual martyrdom and uh, representational martyrdom in in, in film and, and you know uh, and that sort of thing kind of blurs the boundaries and maybe numbs the senses to that where uh, viewers today are they really struck as deeply when they see uh, an image of someone dying for example that there was a, a, a that the the person who was recently shot in the United States by a police officer, a black person was shot. And, and that video was replayed on CNN and on different news organizations over and over and over again. And, but you can see people getting shot on TV shows all the time. So is there a sense that the idea of martyrdom can be both bolstered and weakened by uh, the way that media can portray it today? I think that's a very interesting observation because I think the screen both brings us close to suffering or close to a martyrdom. And so we can see it more closely, but it also can screen us off from the suffering. Yeah. So in a strange way, we are distanced from it because we're often in comfortable situations. We might be not threatened um, by what we see because we can see it in the relative comfort of our house or on our mobile phone and so on. And yet there are certain deaths that do stay with us. Mm. And it's interesting that Søren Kierkegaard, you, the Danish philosopher, theologian, he said that the, the tyrant dies and his rule is over, but the martyr dies and his rule begins and I, I think that's, I mean, I almost want to say that again, you know, when the tyrant dies, that's the end. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when the martyr dies, his, his or her rule begins. And so there's a sense in which certain deaths hold on. Uh, I think it was Indra Gandhi who herself was killed, uh, Prime Minister of India, said that m martyrdom is, isn't an end, it's a beginning. And it's interesting to think about how martyrdom can be a beginning in certain instances. Yeah. And you mentioned the tyrant too. And this is not only a religious – in a religious sense, uh, but also perhaps in a political sense. Is it possible today to disentangle political and religious martyrdoms? 
No, I mean, I, I have a, a friend, a colleague, a very uh, interesting academic friend who said all martyrdoms are political. Now, I'm not sure I fully agreed with him, but it, it stayed with me as a phrase. I was actually working on the book at the time. And, and I remember visiting a number of churches in St. Petersburg in Russia and seeing a number of different icons mm-hmm. uh, of Nicholas, Nicholas, the, the, the last czar of Russia and Alexei, yes. his son, Nicholas II. And, and these are seen in the Orthodox tradition, the Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox tradition as uh, proto-martyrs or even uh, uh, martyrs themselves as, uh, or as new martyrs. And it's, it's striking how you can see how monarchs there uh, both have a political, they're used politically and religiously in the same way that Charles I, uh, you can see him, uh, of course, had his, uh, the, the king who was executed in London back in the um, 17th century, that his story was repeated again and again and, and was used politically, not just religiously, but politically. It's really interesting because those types of stories can be used, you mentioned Nicholas, for example, to, to either bolster or subvert the status quo, right? So stories of martyrs can be used to reinforce or challenge existing powers. Well, exactly. And you can see, for example, in the suffragette movement, how I don't know if you know the story of is it Emily Davison in 1913. She went to protest um, at the races, the horse races, uh-huh. and she she stepped in front of the king's horse and she was killed. Now, there's a debate. Was she trying to be killed or was she actually just um uh, trying to make a protest, right. but after her death, she di- they died a few days later. She was turned into a Christian martyr, into a martyr. She there's a picture of her again in the book. You can see of she now has wings and a halo, mm-hmm. and she's linked with um, Joan of Arc, another interesting uh, figure, but from the Middle Ages. So, and the phrase that she says is that love that overcometh, and so you can see there. The death of one figure, she became a martyr for the movement uh, in a way that many of the figures that we've been thinking about became martyrs for religious movements. She became martyr really for a political movement to try and get women votes and um, more rights in Britain at that time. Yeah. Before we go, I also wanted to ask you about your interest in this topic. What led you to study the phenomenon of martyrdom enough to write this very short introduction on it? I'd spent a lot of time looking at media violence, how different kinds of media represents violence. And one aspect I was looking at was around martyrdom. And I began to become intrigued, fascinated by that. And also, I suppose, quite disturbed about the way in which martyrdom was being manipulated and used uh, and perhaps abused as an idea. Uh, And that led me into thinking about issues related to peace building and martyrdom. And I thought, well, this is an opportunity to uh, to explore this in greater detail. It was interesting. And when I spoke to the publisher, we were talking about, should I do a book on peace or martyrdom? And she thought a book on martyrdom would sell better than peace. I mean, it's a whole, it's interesting. But I, it's one, one phrase that stayed with me is um, Oscar Romero, the um, San Salvadorian Archbishop, he, he said it just about eight months before he was murdered, that it's very easy to kill, especially when one has weapons, but about how hard it is to let oneself be killed for love of the people. And that phrase has really stayed with me. It's a phrase I actually use to, to finish the book with, because it's this idea that it may be easy to kill lots of people, but actually to give up your life for other people is something which is extraordinary and something which is is well worth uh, not just putting a question mark over but investigating and i think your book really does help do that uh, the book is martyrdom a very short introduction by jolly and mitchell he's professor at the university of edinburgh and director of the center for theology and public issues there so i uh, want to thank you for coming on the show and talking about this today thank you blair i've really enjoyed talking with you all right that's it uh, that was great uh,